he's weakening institutions, and、um, you know, whenever he passes away, it could be, <laughs> as I was saying, you know, Song Ping is 105, so we we could have、uh, another、uh, 35 years. Death of Stalin. Next one will be Death of Xi. Hello, and welcome to Chinese Whispers with me, Cindy Yu. Every episode, I'll be talking to journalists, experts, and longtime China watchers about the latest in Chinese politics, society, and more. There'll be a smattering of history to catch you up on the background knowledge and some context as well. How did the Chinese see these issues? This week, Xi Jinping has taken his new Politburo Standing Committee on a group field trip to Yan'an, the revolutionary base of Mao Zedong's Communist Party after the Long March. The symbolism is easy to see. On this episode of Chinese Whispers, I've asked back Bill Bishop, who runs the popular Cynicism newsletter, and Professor Victor Shi, author of Coalitions of the Week, to talk about the Party Congress that's just finished. You might remember that we talked about the Party Congress、uh, a few episodes ago, before it started. So, would highly recommend listeners go check that one out too. Victor, Bill, welcome back to Chinese Whispers.、Um, Let's start with the personnel first, which we talked about a lot last time. We speculated that Xi might have to bargain、uh, to, in order to stay in position for longer. He might have to give some positions to、um, people from other corners of the party. But Bill, as you've written about, it seems to be a tongchi. Xi is running the table. He's taken all the winnings, so he hasn't basically given anything to anyone else that he didn't want to. That's what it looks like from.、Uh... Both from the composition of the Central Committee and then through to the Politburo and the and the Standing Committee. I mean, I think that,、um, you know, and I really want to hear what Victor thinks. But it, it looks like there there was no even pretense of any sort of a balancing or moderating with other other significant interests if there are any left in the system. And so, from a personnel perspective, I think she got what he wanted from, you know, the. Revised party constitution was just issued, and it isn't clear yet that he got everything he wanted. In that have, actually haven't fully digested it. But personnel-wise, I think it does look like a like a running the table.、Mm. Well, Victor, let me bring you in here. What, what did you make of it? And also, do we glean from this that she has more power in the party than we thought he did two weeks ago? Well, I, you know, I think、um, I had suspected that he could do that. But I thought he would do it. A first of all, you know, I thought he would do it in a more、um, kind of legalistic way than he did.、Um, so, you know, as, as I、uh, speculated earlier, I thought he might have changed the retirement age, you know, to one year earlier. Then、uh, he could have expelled、um, Li Keqiang and Wang Yang from the Politburo Standing Committee. But、uh, then he would also have to move、uh, Wang Huning out of the Politburo Standing Committee. But as it turns out,、um, he just did it, you know, purely according to his own preference,、uh, without any kind of reference to any rules or, you know,、uh, norms that you could think of. So, you know, the three people who got moved up, Ding Shuxiang, Li Qiang, and Cai Qi, they, you know, as Bill was joking earlier, I mean, they were kind of personal secretaries to him in the past, in sort of past three stages of his career. Um, then you had Li Xi,、uh, and well, Zhao Luoji was there already. Who、uh, were these family friends, basically? You know, friends of the family, people who had worked for or related to other people,、uh, to people close to his father,、uh, and sort of、uh, whom he had known for decades and decades, trusted by him.、Um, and then Zhang Youxia was the big norm-busting one. I mean, the guy is seventy-two. He got reappointed to the Politburo, presum- and also the Central Military Commission.、Uh, typically, people in the military they do retire later、uh, for their level, but still, I mean, Zhang Youxia. That's we haven't seen anything like this since the nineties, really.、Um, so, yeah, there's no just purely his preference, no reference to.、Uh, Any norm shifts or, or anything, and the other age sort of noticeable age, kind of norm busting was Wang Yi on the Politburo, right? Who who looks、yes. like he'll take over from Yang Jiechi as the as the head of the Foreign Affairs Commission as their top diplomat. And if those norms had held, he I think he's sixty nine. He would have aged out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because because the norm had been if you're sixty eight or over,、yeah. you would be retired. 
But of course, we have some people under 68 um, who are retired anyways, but we'll, we'll come on to that. Just on the on, on C's men for now, um, Bill, are some of these people qualified or competent to do the jobs that they possibly are being lined up to do? So, for example, people point to uh, Tai Chi not having much central government experience or any central government experience. They point to people like Li Tian, the former Shanghai party secretary who, you know, oversaw this horrific and inhumane prolonged lockdown in Shanghai earlier this this year. It seems like loyalty comes above merit in, in this instance. Or merit is loyalty is merit. Um, depending on how, no, but it's seriously, it, like you look at Li, someone like Li Qiang, I think before the Shanghai lockdown disaster, um, plenty of people thought he was competent. You know, he's run Shanghai, he's run Jiangsu province. He was, I think, governor of Zhejiang province. So he's been number one or number two in three of the largest economic um, sort of centers of China, each of, each of which I think is bigger than most European countries in terms of economic output. Um, so it's hard to say that he's not a competent bureaucrat up to a point. Clearly, the Shanghai lockdown was a disaster. And I do think it, it does, to your earlier point, remind everyone that this idea of meritocracy is, is either doesn't really matter or meritocracy. It's a different kind of merit, which is more like loyalty and closest to Xi because of his longstanding ties with Xi. So, you know, I think it, well, I was surprised he got not only premier, but he's also number two in the hierarchy. Right. He was vaulted. You know, he, he went above Jalaji, above Wang Huning, you know, people with more more seniority in the party and on the standing committee. Uh, tai Chi is one where, again, he's run he's run Beijing. He's he's has a long experience in the government. You know, he's he's clearly a competent bureaucrat and and um, administrator. I mean, his his time in Beijing, he did a very good job with COVID. He's done a very good job with COVID. He did have the incident. I think it was. Was 2017 where they after there was a big fire um, in southern Beijing, they cleaned out uh, tens of thousands of migrant workers in the middle of winter and just basically kicked them out. And a lot of people, you know, it was, it was literally the middle of winter. Um, and again, that looked like it was incompetent, but maybe that was what she wanted and he did his job. Mm -hmm. And Victor, this is something that we talked about on on the last time we spoke, which was about what these people believe in and whether or not their ideology really matters when it comes to policy. Like, are they split by policy differences or is it just patronage differences? For someone like Li Tiang, I thought it was interesting that some of the business community, particularly in Shanghai, where he had been known, thought that, oh, maybe this is a good thing for those who believe in marketization, those who believe in trade, because Li Tiang had had a reputation for being good for business. Does that matter now? Was it ever deeply held convictions? Um, is that going to ch change the way that China has been governed at all? Yeah, I think the dynamic uh, will be different between Shanghai and his new position as the premier of China. Uh, in Shanghai, you know, just because I think Xi Jinping as one person, he can't possibly pay attention to all the nitty gritty details in every, you know, part of China. Um, there might have been some room for Li Qiang to enact some policies or informally, you know, uh, give more leeway to businesses. Um, as the premier of China, on the other hand, I think, um, you know, he's enacting national level policies that are more likely to be reviewed and, and approved by Xi Jinping himself. Um, so, you know, if Xi Jinping favors one direction or another, he, of course, has no choice but to implement uh, policies according to Xi Jinping's wishes. Is there some flexibility on his part? I think there still will be some flexibility on his part um, to interpret uh, you know, what common prosperity, for example, mean. Um, but there are some very clear things that Xi Jinping would like, uh, as outlined in the political work report. Uh, it looks like higher taxes are coming, you know, for, for the wealthy in China, because uh, this was explicitly mentioned in the political work report. So um, <laughs> I don't know, maybe that explains like the market crash and all that kind of stuff <laughs> right after Congress. And Bill, let's talk about the work report, because as Victor um, has mentioned just now, we, we saw a little bit about the future economic policy in that common prosperity was mentioned, and that's this evening out of uh, inequality in China. What else was notable from the work report to you? Um, well, there was certainly also, I think there was a phrase that 
seemed to freak some people out around sort of regulating wealth accumulation. I'm paraphrasing. Um, and, and and that got a lot of notice. In general, the, the C's report to the Congress, I think, um, you know, a lot of the themes were ones that shouldn't have been a surprise. They, they really built on top of like the, the sixth plenum last year, the historical, the third historical resolution, uh, various things he and the party have been saying. I think, you know, the the focus, a lot of focus on security, a lot of focus on um, sort of technology, self-sufficiency. And then there was that, uh, the changing of the language around this concept of period of strategic opportunity to, which is sort of the idea that China had a relatively benign security environment in which it could develop. I mean, I'm, I'm simplifying here to one that is now it's sort of both there's opportunity and there are lots more challenges. And so it's a general, I think, an indication of a, of a real shift in the assessment of their external environment to one that is much more uh, challenging and in some places potentially hostile to China. And left unsaid, but clearly the driver of many of these themes was the U.S.-China relationship and, and how bad it's gotten. And, and I think how, how much worse uh, the, the leadership in Beijing thinks it may get. And Victor, and of course, a continuation of zero COVID as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, so to me, I'm a little bit more optimistic. I mean, first of all, there there has been some mild relaxation of COVID policies vis-a-vis -vis the foreign business community. Um, they're supposedly going to get like expedited uh, quarantine. <laughs> I don't know what that means. You know, if there's a quarantine, how can it be expedited? Um, but... But to me, the one encouraging sign was that uh, at the beginning of the speech, of course, it declared yet again, zero COVID was the right thing to do, uh, you know, Victoria's policy. Uh, but in the rest of the speech in the political work report, there actually was not a lot of explicit discussion on zero COVID. Um, there was some wording, you know, kind of more vague wording like, oh, you know, we have to do better in uh, disease prevention and, and dealing with diseases and, and so on and so forth. Um, but not, I mean, I would have dreaded, you know, a whole paragraph on like, you know, we must continue zero COVID in the next five years. Uh, all cadres, you know, up and down the party must resolutely follow this policy. Uh, that kind of wording uh, did not appear. So uh, at least, so I still think zero COVID will last for another year at least, but uh, it provides some flexibility for uh, more relaxation down the road. Uh, but of course, I don't think that there's going to be any meaningful relaxation until there's a mass vaccination campaign or, or a booster campaign. Uh, and it's just not evident at this point. Yeah. Bill, were you hoping or expecting for Zero COVID to be finished earlier? No, I, I agree with what Victor said. I mean, it was in there, but it wasn't, it wasn't you know, the, it, it sort of leaves some hope that it will be tweaked and calibrated but not so much hope that it's going away anytime soon. And what about on Taiwan? Because that's something that Western media has picked up on a little bit, that there's this refusal to rule out force in reunifying Taiwan. Is that significant at all, um, Bill? Um, I mean, the language in the in the report that Xi Jinping gave to the party Congress, I don't think there was anything new, was there, um, around Taiwan? And so, you know, the, 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 there is no... It's interesting here in D.C. especially, there's a real um, kind of a frenzy that, you know, they've moved up the timeline. They're, they're accelerating their timeline for taking Taiwan. And yet in the actual documents, um, there's nothing that, that sort of indicates that they've made that decision. And so I don't think from a from a Taiwan perspective, the work report itself was a, 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 it indicated any sort of a significant uh, shift in policy. I mean, there is this idea that to to achieve the great sort of rejuvenation of China, Taiwan has to be returned to the motherland. And the target for the rejuvenation is 2049. So people say, well, then it has to happen by 2049, 27 years from now. Um, that could, that's sort of the only obvious sort of inferred timeline in there. But Victor, can I, can I, you know, before I let you respond to Bill, can I also add, uh, lay down an additional gauntlet, which is that now that C is confirmed, confirmed in a, another at least we think i mean i don't even know if we can say it's five years or ten years or however long it is the second decade at least that he is starting um does that give it a time limit as well because is he going to be want to be the person who does this 
he manages to solve the Taiwan problem? Um, yeah, I think he does want it. Um, I mean, frankly, I think the personnel lineup suggests it also. Uh, in fact, it's suggested for the next five years sometimes. Because if you think about it, why do you want people whom you trust absolutely to fill every single important position, uh, including, you know, vice chairman of the CMC, uh, as well as public real standing committee, but then of course, people who are now in charge of national security issues, uh, and the ministry of public security, um, you know, there's been some discussion by Sheena Greiton and others on the fact that there are now two security people close to Xi in the secretariat, uh, Wang Xiaohong and uh, Chen Wenqing. Um, what, what's the advantage of having that, right? So because even Chairman Mao didn't do this. So Chairman Mao had these puppet figures from uh, the old guard in the Politburo, even in, during the Cultural Revolution, because it's always helpful to have this facade of collective leadership. And if things go wrong, you can say, oh, we're, we collectively bear the responsibility. Um, but she didn't go for that. She wanted, you know, completely his own people. So then if things were to go wrong, he himself would bear responsibility, but then he doesn't care. Uh, an advantage of having that is that you can make very extreme policies, right? So whatever extreme policies he enacts, no one is going to say no or try to undermine it. You know, basically the people whom he trusts, at least at that level, they will uh, presumably do the best to implement whatever extreme policy he chooses. Um, and of course, Taiwan is the most plausible ex extreme policies that he could uh, enact. But it doesn't mean that he'll do it, right? So, you know, it's like he's lining things up. Maybe he won't do anything. Mm -hmm. And Victor, just on that, and with your hat on of, of comparing to Mao and previous leaders, has Xi Jinping may, taken away one source of resilience for the party? Because I had always thought that given that this is an authoritarian party, if they can manage peaceful transition or if they can manage internal um, balancing and checking mechanisms, then it actually is more resilient than a one-person dictatorship. But he's taken that away and he's got yes men around him. So does he actually make the party less secure by doing this kind of lineup? Oh, yeah, of course. Um... Well, so this is a case where, but, but you know, dictators do that. They, they actually don't care uh, about the long-term uh, fate of the party. I mean, despite what they say, it's like, oh, I'm setting the party up for the next thousand years, et cetera, et cetera. The way, um, you know, because by arranging politics this way, you actually weaken the institutions. Uh, because basically people under you, they have no incentive to build up their own power, their own uh, institution, institutional base, because the moment you do that, you make the dictator suspicious, you get purged. Um, and then also, as he gets older, politics will be very, very personalist, uh, personalistic, because uh, he's going to be sick, he's going to lay in his you know, bed or something like that. And basically all the decision-making has to work around him. And so, you know, all these pretense of Politburo meetings and all this kind of stuff will go out the window. Um, <clears throat> yeah, no, it, he's weakening institutions. And, um, you know, whenever he passes away, it could be, <laughs> as I was saying, you know, Sunping is 105, so we, we could have uh, another uh, 35 years. Death of Stalin, next one will be death of Xi. No, it, it's a... Um... The other thing, right, too, Victor, is it's not like there won't be factions. Now there's going to be, oh, yeah. I think that we should expect lots of infighting among, quote unquote, she's men, right, as they jockey for. Well, especially in the in the security apparatus, I, I feel like there will be incredible just infighting in all these agencies, between agencies, within agency. Um, yeah, I don't know how that's going to be managed. But, but exactly. So basically, as we're saying, there's so many disadvantages to what he's doing. And so you really have to think about what are the advantages of doing that? Um, what, why, just, just briefly, Victor, why, why do you think there will be so much infighting, especially around among the security apparatus? Oh, I mean, so I, I have to say, you know, Xi Jinping is a brilliant politician. Wang Xiaohong, for example, extremely powerful now as Minister of Public Security, uh, got into the Secretariat, but not the Politburo. Uh, I don't think he got in the Politburo. 
Right, but then Chen Wenqing, uh, presumably will be Zhang Huawei Shuji, but then uh, equal to Wang Xiaohong in the Secretariat, so they're both members of it. Um, so those two will clash because now what she, what the political work report said. I mean, the part of the reason why there was so many mentions of uh, Anquan security was that there was a pretty long section about how national security risks have to be managed in the future. You know, there's an integrated examination of external and internal threat. What does that mean? You know, you do have these two agencies, MSS, um, right. MPS, they will share a lot of jurisdictions. There's, I mean, it's, it's going to be a, you know, already probably is kind of a mess already, but, but there's going to be a bigger mess. Um, and then it's like, who is going to adjudicate all the conflicts that will arise between these two agencies? Well, presumably he might find it quite helpful. She might find it quite helpful to be above that and adjudicate between different factions in the same way that Mao did. I'm sorry. One, one thing, if I could just add about Taiwan and the language, um, cause I, in the party, the revised party constitution, there is language added about resolutely and opposed, resolutely opposed and per separatists seeking Taiwan independence. That I think is new language. And so there is some thought that that might signal, say, some sort of a Taiwan national security law that they passed. It would, would, um, but in terms of like a timeline for evasion, again, it's, it just, I just want to go back to this point because you hear it all over DC that they're moving up their timeline and so far, nobody seems to have any actual evidence. It's all based on analytical assessments. It could be right, but there is a bit of a frenzy here in D.C. now um, about sort of it's happening faster. And you also don't want to say it's impossible because what if it does happen? Because it's not impossible. To Victor's point, you know, you could certainly look at the way he's he's sort of laid out the, the, the personnel and said he's got to make some really big decisions that basically – you know, that are very momentous decisions and it's going to be much easier now in this kind of a setup. So it is concerning. Bill, this is very much an aside and it's not strictly Chinese whispers related, but do you think that the foreign policy community and the intelligence community in DC are feeling pretty confident in their predictions these days, given that they think that they called the Russian invasion right? And so on Taiwan, they, they're, they're also feeling relatively confident. I hope not. Um, I mean, I no, because I, I don't think I don't think that we actually I mean, it's, I wish it were funny, but I don't think that actually like like from from at least from the public accounts, the, the U.S. and allied intelligence, um, you know, allied countries had actually quite good intelligence into the into the into Putin's decision making process and intentions. I don't think we have anything like that around Xi. And I think that we're all struggling, you know, public. And then I think in the classified world from everything I hear. And again, I don't mind the classified world, but from everything I hear there, there's not, there used to be much better streams of information and now it's much harder to figure out. And I think that, that again is, I think she, she got, when she took power, he realized that, that foreign intelligence agencies had a lot of access and a lot of insight into what was going on. And he's very uh, intentionally uh crack down on a lot of, of uh, a lot of uh, espionage. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the big corruption cases will ha turn out to have actually been about these guys selling secrets. Okay, and back to the Congress then, because it's been, you know, a more dramatic one than I think people were expecting. You know, we started the Saturday before the Congress with this public protest from this single man in Beijing on uh, one of the bridges, one of the uh, road bridges with a banner of various things that they did not want. And the things that they did want was very clearly aimed at the authoritarian regime and Xi Jinping himself. Then... The week after, we had Hu Jintao, former president, in an act where he was forcibly ex es escorted from the People's uh, Great Hall of the People. So it's been <laughs> more dramatic, I think, than the kind of properly choreographed Congress than, that the party wanted. Um, Bill, can we talk about the Hu Jintao incident? Because there's so many theories flying around about what exactly happened there. Um, Bill, first, give us, your, give us your take on what happened there. I wish I knew, um, honestly. No, I mean, there's a longer video that came out, I think, Monday night. Um, clearly, Hu Jintao was uh, disturbed about something. Um, he is sick. He has Parkinson's. He's had diabetes for a long time. You know, my first pass, I had a dad and a stepdad who had dementia. 
Um, you know, my first pass was there was something going on cognitively that he sort of got upset about and you can get really irrational when, when that happens. Um, and that would be the sort of more benign explanation for what happened. He was, um, but I think, I think there, there are a couple of takeaways regardless of what really happened is one, it was humiliating. Um, it just, it just was a really bad look. Dulian is he completely lost face? Yeah, and Dulian, and it was also the the other leadership didn't look great because I mean Li Jianshu actually looked like he was trying to help him. Li Jianshu looked like sort of like he had some sense of humanity. The rest of the the rest of the folks up there just either totally ignored it or just kind of nodded like ha 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 and like just you know wave him away. Um, I think the other point though is it is it is just the the perfect symbol for the um, the destruction of any sort of power centers related to Hu Jintao. Um, it shows up in the it shows up in the personnel, and so it's it's just again a sort of a, a end of an era. Um, in terms of what happened, you know, we we may never know. There are various stories going around. There are people who are convinced that it was a more um, malign event that there was something that was agreed to that Xi Jinping changed around personnel and who Jita got upset about. We don't know. It's certainly possible. Uh, you know, one thing to look at potentially is his son, Hu Haifeng, is a delegate, and he's a he's the party secretary of a city in Zhejiang province. If there really is something going on, will he have problems in a few months? Maybe not tomorrow. And he was in a hall watching that happen. Watching this happen to his dad, it must have been very mm. difficult personally. So I, I wish we do, but but I will say, and then I'll turn over to Victor. Is just. If 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 the the darker scenario where there was something going on where she changed something or manipulated the process in a way that was a surprise to Hu Jintao, and then this is what happened, and I'm not saying that is what happened, I'm saying we can't rule it out at this point, then that matters because it matters in terms of what kind of a leader Xi Jinping is, and it matters especially to foreign governments about how you assess what are we dealing with in terms of the top leader. So I hope we find out the answer. I I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't know if we'll ever find out an answer. Yeah, but Victor, what, what's your best guess? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it seemed like he was disturbed. Um, you know, when he opened up this red folder uh, and started looking at it, there's one speculation. Actually, my students uh, were like, "Well, you know, because Xi Jinping himself hadn't opened up the red folder to look at it, you know, and it's presumably just a list of the new Central Committee members." Uh, then no one could open it up. And because he started opening it up, uh, he was breaking the rule. Um, but I, I think to me, even if that were the case, I mean, Hu Jintao was the secretary general of the Chinese Communist Party. He should be given a certain degree of respect. And for him to like, you know, whether it's because of Parkinson or because he's upset or whatever, he starts looking at it, um, then almost immediately he gets escorted out. Uh, that's a very extreme thing. Uh, and, you know, again, I I thought, yeah, very revealing the scene where Li Zhanshu tried to help, but then Wang Huning pulled him back. Wang Huning being one of those who's now stand, staying on the standing committee well, and has survived three different communist leaders. Right, so he knows what it takes, right, to, to survive. Um, so, so I, that makes me think that at least for Wang Huning, he must have interpreted it as a very political event and that he knew that whoever helped uh, can potentially be implicated in this, you know, shijian, this event, this political event. Uh, this level of like paranoia is really just like the Mao period, you know. I mean, where everyone is so afraid of fan cuo wu, right, you know, make a mistake. And and we really are kind of back to that, certainly in the elite, uh, but it, that will filter down to Chinese society. And what's... And it also wasn't very Confucian, sorry. No, it wasn't that, it I think... Drag, drag the old leader away. I know, I, that's my, that's what's... Escort, escort him away. He wasn't dragged, he was... He I think was he was manhandled, I, I use that word on Twitter as well. I mean, he, he clearly was pulled, lifted out of his chair. Out of his chair. Yeah. <laughs> as if he was a doll and then just kind of pulled aside. Um, I think what's incredible as well is Li Keqiang's lack of reaction. Because, 
you know, you mentioned the Central Committee name list, which are, which some theories say that that's what um, Hu Jintao was trying to look at. Li Keqiang, the current Premier of China, wasn't on that list. So he not only he's no longer Premier, he's no longer on the Standing Committee, he's not on the Politburo, he's not even on the Central Committee. And Li Keqiang was one of those Hu protégés. But Li just looked straight ahead. He was clearly did not want to have any public demonstration that he had anything to do with this at all. I mean, there, there's something worse awaiting him potentially, which is a jail cell. And he certainly didn't want that. Uh, and yeah, so, so this is what I mean, you know, everyone's so afraid of making a mistake, you know, fun whole that they could not display, certainly could not display any kind of politically meaningful gesture, but even kind of normal, you know, human being helping another human being, they were afraid of doing that also. Well, no, but I mean, it's very dark because basically if they're treating each other like this, you know, how do you think they're going to treat the people of China if Xi Jinping were to order some extreme policies? They will not hesitate. Let's talk about that and as the final, you know, wrap up point, which is now that we know C is going to be in place for at least another term or however long he wants to be, unless he gets ousted. But it seems, as we say, the party is terrified of him. What is that bringing in terms of policy, both for China and for the world? Bill? Um, well, I think um, from a policy perspective, sort of for the rest of the world, again, I don't think we're going to see much deviation from the sort of current trajectory, it, it certainly may ex accelerate or, or um, deepen, but you've got the, the, the main backdrop is uh, growing competition with the U.S. with increasing risk of some sort of a conflict. And, and that's in every domain. Uh, yeah, so there, yeah, there was a lot of wording on technological competition, uh, you know, achieving supremacy. But, you know, now that all the legal channels for China to acquire U.S. technologies have been closed off, what do you think will happen? <laughs> you know, the illegal channels will, will, will have to be intensified. Uh, so that's going to be a point of contention, obviously, between two countries. Um, so, you know, one point I've been making is that because Xi Jinping is truly, truly the dictator, it is very important for, uh, you know, the president of the United States uh, and other senior officials to get opportunities to talk to him as much as possible. Uh, and also the same thing for Europe and Japan and other major countries, uh, because we just don't know the kind of information about the United States, about other countries that are going, that are landing on Xi Jinping's desk. And, you know, this information can be incredibly distorted um, and so if anything, just presenting an alternative view of how the world works to him is going to be helpful. He, he may not believe you, you know, of course, his advisors will be all oh, these are imperialist lies and all that kind of stuff. But if you're able to look him in the eye and tell him something, uh, at least he'll be forced to think about it, you know, um, and that he may be less likely to make very rash decisions. Uh, but not talking to him, which is basically what happened in the latter Trump years, um, is just a very dangerous course to pursue for both sides. Um, and so I'm glad that these kind of meetings have resumed. And, um, you know, we have had a couple of Biden meetings. Uh, the one that's planned, hopefully it still will take place despite, you know, everything. Um, so I think these meetings are, are very important. Victor, Bill, thank you so much for joining Chinese Whispers. Thanks for listening. Chinese Whispers is a podcast brought to you by The Spectator. And if you'd like to listen to more, just search Chinese Whispers wherever you get your podcasts from. And if you like what we do here, you might be interested in the Chinese Whispers newsletter that I will be launching in the near future. Sign up for free at spectator.co.uk forward slash whispers, and you'll be getting regular updates from me on the most interesting political and cultural news from China, as well as, of course, a smattering of history. That's spectator.co.uk forward slash whispers.